If everybody had an ocean across the USA, then everybody'd be surfing by California. You'd see him wear the baggy Sarachi sent us to a bushy, bushy blown head dude surfing USA. You catch him surfing at Surfing USA, we'd all be planning out a route. We're gonna take real soon. We're waxing down our support. We can't wait for June. All right, world history, we're back, and today we're talking about one of the darkest chapters in human history: the triangular slave trade. So let's talk about what happened, how it got to be, and how one continent was exploited for all of its resources and all of its people. So this whole thing begins in the 1500s. And this was a very profitable business because if you have a slave, there is zero labor cost into the production of your goods and services. So because it was a hugely profitable business to own slaves and to sell slaves, this commerce between three continents breaks out. So from Europe to Africa, they're going to send goods. So think about things like rifles and uh, food and supplies that can come from the manufacturing of, of Europe. Then from Africa to North America is where you're going to have people being transported on a boat in terrible conditions, treated like cargo, where there was an expectation that 50% of them were gonna die along the trip. So they only brought enough supplies for 50% of the people on board in the hull of the ship. Keep in mind, they are chained together. There's no bathroom. They're uh, having to go to the bathroom on each other. They might get a ladle full of oatmeal and that might be their food for the day. You might have somebody on the chain next to you dying and be on that chain next to you for a day, a week, 10 days, two weeks, while they're still dead. These were horrific conditions. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna include a clip from Amistad, which is about nine minutes, that shows just how horrific this trip was for the people who were being transported as cargo, not being respected as people by any means, to the New World. Now, North America to Europe, that's where tobacco and other uh, raw materials went. Uh, you're going to have a lot of your agrarian uh, commerce break out in the south of the United States and a lot of that stuff's going to go to Europe. And then it creates this flow between one entity to the next and that is going to continue for quite some time. Now what you can see here on the screen is the triangular slave trade and what is going to what location. So. This really starts to kick up in the 17th and 18th century, which would be the 1600s and the 1700s. And you can see the Europeans who are now in North and Central America are sending raw materials to Europe. From Europe, they're sending manufactured goods, usually made from the raw materials in the first place. Those go to Africa. And then those port cities that we talked about that were formed in order to make the trip to Southeast Asia shorter, those port cities become slaver ports now, and the slaves go to North America. So that is a pattern that you will need to recognize for this class, and we're going to have that be a part of the next exam. What was the impact of this incredibly dark chapter in history? Well, by the 1780s alone, think about this, there were 80,000 people being shipped to the Americas per year. To put that in perspective, Dodger Stadium holds 56,000 people. The Staples Center holds 20,000 people. That's still only 76,000. So if you filled up Dodger Stadium and you filled up the Staples Center, you still haven't gotten to the number that was being shipped to the Americas on a year-by-year -year basis. So, some tribes in Africa ceased to exist, and so did their history, and so did their culture. 
There are black people in the United States that have no idea what their ancestry is prior to this time period here. So it erased cultures, it erased tribes, it erased villages, it erased history. Some of these things are gone forever. Now other nations in Africa took the opportunity to make money and to receive muskets and to receive guns by capturing other Africans and selling them to the Europeans. And then what do you think happens when all of the Africans that can be captured are taken? Then they're going to go and take the very individuals that captured their own fellow Africans and sell them off into slavery. Incredibly dark chapter in history we're talking about here. So they fought in wars in order to capture slaves to sell, and this becomes a lucrative economic situation at the expense of millions of people. So let's part, start putting the age of exploration and imperialism together and talk about our next event here. So we know that the Dutch dominated the seas in the 1600s and one of the places they settled in was in Cape Town in South Africa. So the Dutch owned South, South Africa through their conquering of it, but the British are going to fight a war with the Dutch that is called the Boer War. So the Boer War would be the ones where you got the white pith helmets. They would be that era of, of Britain. So when Britain defeats the Dutch in the Boer War, now they want to take all of South Africa for themselves. But there was an African war leader at the time that wasn't going to go lightly. And this individual was named Shaka Zulu. And Shaka Zulu, they didn't have muskets. They didn't have cannons. They didn't even have armor. They didn't have anything except their wits and their general's leadership. They were fighting with spears and shields. And think about what I'm about to tell you. They're taking on one of the most powerful land armies in the world at the time, in the British, who had roughly 5,000 men fully armed with rifles, cannons, etc. They were taking on 2,000 Shaka Zulu warriors who had spears and, and rawhide shields. And despite that overwhelming advantage for the British, the Zulu warriors fought with great fury and great uh, uh, tactics and strength, and they nearly defeated the British before they met their own demise in which Shaka Zulu also died during this time period. So he faced his demise when the well-armed British and Dutch in South Africa wiped out the Zulu warriors, but the Zulu warriors held on for a lot longer than anybody would have thought considering the lopsided numbers and the lopsided technology. Now, as the triangular slave trade was bringing people into a new location to be slaves, other things were traveling as a form of commerce when this was happening. This made new foods available specifically to Europeans, and we know today in 2020 that having a diverse diet will help your immune system and your own overall health. Back then, people usually ate the same thing almost every single day. There wasn't a lot of variety of food. So you got the one thing to eat every day, and that was your life moving forward. When new foods get introduced, it's going to open up people to having uh, more of an interest in different types of foods, and it's also going to improve people's life expectancy and their health. So things that are going to get introduced into Europe are going to be tomatoes, pumpkins, peppers, corn, and potatoes. Now, we often associate potatoes with the Irish or Idaho in the United States, but potatoes were a native people crop. So in the North American region, the native people grew potatoes. Those potatoes eventually went to Europe and that's when Ireland took the potato on for themselves. Now there's gonna be a great potato famine in Ireland, which is going to lead to a mass exodus of people from Ireland. And if anybody who's watching this has Irish descent, there's a very high likelihood that your ancestors came over after the great potato famine which was a new crop to Ireland in the grand scheme of things. Now these new foods lead to a giant population explosion. Number one, people have a more diverse diet. Number two, there's more food available. Number three, their immune system gets boosted. So you're gonna have life expectancy go up in Europe because of these new foods being introduced. Now this is also gonna to lead to a commercial revolution. At the time, inflation was hurting Europe's economy. What inflation means is the spending power of your money goes down as the inflation rate goes up. So for instance, if I had a $100 bill and I put it under my pillow and I left it there for a year, if the inflation rate was 
Technically, my $100 bill is still $100, but now it's only worth $98 compared to the previous year. So inflation, when it gets out of control, can destroy an economy, and that's what we were seeing in Europe. So there was a massive push for laissez-faire, pure market capitalism, and the system that is born out of this is mercantilism. Now, a mercantilist back then, the assumption was that to be a successful economic nation, you need to export more goods than you import. Now, the United States since World War II has had a negative trade balance the, almost the entire time, and you can look at any of the tags of your clothing, whether it be the shoes you have or anything else, look at the tag of where it came from. This uh, came from Thailand, the shoe right here. And our labor in the United States is very expensive, and that's why things are usually made elsewhere. But we have proven as an economy, the United States has, that you don't have to have a positive trade balance. In fact, most of the wealthy nations in the world have a negative trade balance because they have all the wealth to buy the things that the poor labor nations are providing to the world. Now, what you're going to see here, you're going to learn in greater depth in U.S. history next year when you're juniors, but we're going to briefly touch on it now, and it was essentially what happened to the colonies in North America as a result of everything we've just talked about. Well, there was a strict law passed by the British that said the British colonies, the 13 British colonies, they can only trade with Britain. They're not allowed to trade with the French who are in Canada at the time. They're not allowed to trade with the native people who already occupied the land. They're only allowed to trade with Britain. If you were a French settler at the time, you were only allowed to trade with France. So the nations that conquered these areas were expected to only trade with their parent uh, nation that supported them to go there in the first place or didn't support them to go in the first place but did occupy those territories. Now, Strict laws were passed to make sure that the colonies only supported their parent countries. And then these parent countries start to tax the colonists, although the colonists can't have any representation in either of their parliaments. So, in this particular case, this is where the term no, no taxation without representation comes from. And this becomes the battle cry of the early stages of the revolution in the United States or in North America that becomes the United States. Now, Europe's wealth is gonna grow exponentially at the time. They are going to be the most valuable and wealthy continent on the planet as a result of everything we've spoken about today. And with the taxation on the colonists, without them having any say in what this taxation is gonna be, the colonies soon grow very angry with Europe, which will lead to the American Revolution. Now we're going to talk about the revolutions in this class, the English Revolution, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Russian Revolution. We're going to talk about a lot of these things, but right now we're just setting the stage. So that concludes this unit, which means the next time I see you, we will have our third exam. My study guide is on my staff webpage, and make sure you watch all the videos and you've done the book questions before you take the exam. Copy box, you know what to do now. Place out. Waxing down our surfboard We can't wait for June We'll all be gone in the summer We're on safari to stay Tell the teacher we're surfing Surfing USA Agonies and Swamis Pacific Palisades Sending our friends sunset We're down to beach LA Surfing, surfing USA. Everybody's gone surfing, surfing USA.